In 2011, two beautiful Swiss twin sisters went for a walk with their father but never returned home. Their walk ended in a kidnapping. However, when the father was found, the girls weren't with him. Today's case will talk about the disappearance of twin sisters Alessia and Livia Shep. In Switzerland in 2003, Irina Mamie Lucidi Shep met Matthias Kasper Shep on a company field trip. They both worked at Philip Morris, a tobacco firm. She was a lawyer and he was an engineer. They met often and soon became intimate. Early the following year, Irina was pregnant. The news took everyone by surprise and the couple decided to make their relationship official. They later discovered that Irina was expecting twin girls. The couple officially married in July and on October 7, 2004, Alessia Vera Shep and Livia Clara Shep were born. The family were happy, but in 2006, Irina developed septicemia, also known as sepsis. This is a condition where the immune system has an exaggerated response to an infection. It can be caused by bacteria, fungi or viruses and can result in organic dysfunction where normal body functions become compromised. Symptoms of sepsis may include fever, low blood pressure, rapid breathing and confusion, but they vary depending on the severity of the infection. With two new babies and a wife not at work, Matthias began to absolve himself of all responsibilities. It is not clear whether he had behaved in this way previously, but when the twins were born he became very controlling, and this caused significant strain on the couple's relationship. Matthias started to write down everything he needed to do, leaving reminders throughout the house, labelling food, dates, times for tasks, etc. Perhaps he needed to feel in control due to the pressures of fatherhood and the worry that came with his increased responsibilities. While Irina soon recovered and returned to her activities, Matthias had changed. In 2007, the girls were between the ages of two and three. Their nightly routine was 7pm dinner, 7.30pm wash the dishes, 8pm watch TV, 8.30pm bath, organise clothes, brushing teeth. At 9pm the bedroom lights were turned off. Their routine was fairly typical, but for Matthias it was mandatory. No one could alter it in any way. If something broke the routine, he would be furious. We know that he never took it out on the girls or Irina, but he would become highly agitated, feeling like he was losing control of everything. Irina talked to him and told him that his behaviour was harming their relationship. She suggested that he seek psychological help to help him deal with these situations. He did, but unfortunately there was no improvement. In 2010, when the girls were five years old, Irina asked for a divorce. Matthias was not happy about this. He did not want to separate from his wife. He agreed to move out to see if they had a chance, but for her, it was no use. In December, she filed the paperwork and she received everything in the last week of January. Irina never stopped her husband from seeing his daughters. He saw them every weekend, picking them up on Friday after school and returning them to Irina's house on Sunday afternoon. On January 26, 2011, Irina emailed Matthias saying that the divorce documents were ready and that he needed to sign them. On Friday, January 28th, Matthias picked up the girls from school as usual. But on Sunday, January 30th, he called his wife to let her know that the girls were going to stay with him that night and he would bring them to school the following morning. Irina agreed and asked to talk with the girls. Matthias said that they were playing next door and that they would call her later. She insisted on speaking to them as she missed them but Matthias had already hung up the phone. It is not known whether Matthias cut the call or if there was a transmission signal failure. It was later discovered that the call had not been made from Switzerland, but from Lyon, in the south of France, a neighbouring country to Switzerland. After this, his cell phone remained switched off. 
Irina felt that something was wrong and decided to go to his apartment. When she got there, she discovered that the property was empty. The neighbor said that he had not brought the girls to play with her daughter either. Irina immediately called the police. Irina spent days in total despair with no word from her husband and daughters. The police were unable to discover his whereabouts. Then, on February 4th, she received a postcard from Matthias, posted from the city of Marseille. I love you. I don't know how to live without you, but it's too late now. In the following days, she received more postcards from Matthias, which she handed over for investigation. On the 5th, Interpol contacted more than 180 cities in Europe, and the search for the sisters became known as Operation Twins. But unfortunately, it was already too late. What the police discovered over the following weeks left Irina in a state of shock. On January 31st, around 12.30pm, Matthias began making cash withdrawals from ATMs in Marseille. The amount withdrawn was approximately €8,000. He had drained his accounts. It was in this city that he bought and sent the first postcard. Later, he bought three tickets for a boat trip to Corsica for one adult and two children. The journey would transit through Propriano, a French island. Their overnight trip would take around 12 hours. But now comes the strangest part of this case. Many witnesses on the boat reported that they saw Matthias and the twins both boarding and on deck. The girls were seen playing outside and the captain himself confirmed their presence on the vessel. It wasn't difficult to notice the girls. They were two children, very happy, smiling and twins. The problem was that those who saw him leave said that he did so on his own. No one remembered seeing twins leaving the boat. Matthias disembarked the boat on the morning of February 1st. It is not known what he did that day. He later left a city called Bastia, to the north of this island, which is 3 hours 30 minutes away by car from where he disembarked. He took another ferry to Toulon, thus returning to French territory on another night trip. On the second, he was photographed at a toll booth heading towards Italy. On the third, he was seen by witnesses in the city of Naples, Italy, which is 12 hours from Toulon. In each place he visited, he sent postcards to Irina in envelopes containing money. The quantities varied with each post, but the total from the first to the last letter reached approximately €8,000, the amount he had withdrawn from his account. The content of the letters was not disclosed, only the excerpt of one, which said, The children rest in peace, they did not suffer. On February 4th, he went to a train station in the city of Apulia, Italy, three and a half hours away from Naples. At this station, he simply waited for the first arriving train and threw himself in front of it. Matthias's car was found at the end of the month, parked near warehouses in the city of Apulia. During simultaneous investigations at his home, the police discovered that two days before he kidnapped the girls, on January 26th, the day of Irina's email talking about the divorce paperwork, he had researched methods of poisoning, suicide, and he had also researched guns. There were post-its, reminder papers, information about his routine. One said, delete Facebook. His social network was no longer active. With these facts, some theories were put forward. The first theory is that Matthias killed his daughters on the boat, first putting them to sleep and then throwing them into the sea. But taking into account his words that they did not suffer, the only hypothesis is that they were deeply asleep to the point that any subsequent act that ended their lives would not be felt. The second, less likely theory is that he sold the girls to a family on the boat but there are no records of emails or calls from him making contact with people for this purpose. 
In this theory, they would have been drugged and were taken from the boat asleep in the arms of strangers. A third theory, similar to the second, is that in addition to being sold, the girls were separated and given to different families. Therefore, because potential witnesses were being asked about twins, no one reported seeing anything. Regarding the second and third theories, the question remains, where is this money? These and other weaker theories focus heavily on the boat. It is certain that he boarded with the girls at night, but left alone the following morning. The reasons why Matthias did all this remain unanswered. Perhaps there was mental confusion. He drove randomly through France and Italy, covering more than 3,000 kilometers in five days, which makes no sense at all. Irina left her job at the tobacco factory and on August 24th of that same year, she created Missing Children Switzerland, a foundation responsible for helping to locate missing children. Despite being based in Switzerland, in March of the following year, 2012, the project demonstrated such organisation that in just seven months, they became part of the official European support foundations for child and youth disappearances. If you go to her website, missingchildren.ch, in the section titled The Foundation and then History, you will see a record of the incredible trajectory that this project has achieved over the last decade. Unfortunately, to this day, the whereabouts of Alessia Vera Shep and Livia Clara Shep are still unknown. If you've made it this far, please don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to this channel. Also, add your opinion in our comments. Thank you very much. I will see you in the next case.